for tapes of end time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com or lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Monday evening, December the 24th, 1979. Midwinter camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Bill Britton, Springfield, Missouri, is the speaker of the evening. I have a word tonight. I think that the Lord impressed on me uh, last night when David was preaching. And I told David also, Brooke, that I felt like I would start uh, from where he was going last night and carry on this theme of the nature of Christ, this new creation man. Praise the Lord. Amen. And I appreciate very much what God is doing here in this place. I've been looking forward a long time to being here and, and uh, glad we could finally make it. But uh, we've been very, very busy. and uh, We've had a church and I've been giving a lot of my time to the raising up of a body of people there in Springfield and getting them established and uh, we have it now. We have uh, a group of people there. We have three fine pastors who are really dedicated in giving themselves to the ministry uh, of that church. And finally, financially, we had all our property paid for, and so we don't owe the bank anything. We were all clear, and I just felt like this is a good time for me to sort of back off and say, Brethren, here it is. You take it over, you know. Uh, when God was moving, and uh, we had to use a good deal of discipline to to keep some of these unruly spirits from just taking over, spirits of the flesh, to try to move in, and uh, to just move in and take authority where they had not labored. And uh, we just had to really use some discipline at times, and people accused me of building my own kingdom and all, and I said, uh, that was when we was in a little store building, and I said, Lord, if I was going to build a kingdom, it wouldn't be in a little store building somewhere. I'd go out and try to work up something big, you know, that's what the flesh wants. And uh, But um, we weren't there to build a kingdom except for God. And now that the work is going good, we just finally just said we just got too much to do to try to keep on giving uh, a major part of our time to the work in Springfield. So we backed off and just give our responsibility to the other pastors there. And, and uh, I still go there when I'm home and I still preach when I'm there uh, if I have something to preach. And I'm still functioning as one of the elders in the body, but... I just don't feel the responsibility for that work like I used to. The Lord just kind of lifted it up because we have our correspondence course and I'm way behind on that. We have radio broadcasts daily and uh, when I go anywhere I have to get those up ahead of time and uh, put them on tape and leave them there at the station. And we have um, our tape ministry and a writing ministry. I brought my typewriter, by the way, down here hoping that I get a few hours perhaps to sit down and do some typing and uh, maybe write something. Uh, or start to write something while we're here, but I don't know whether we'll get that time or not. But I've got it just in case. And uh, with the writing, the tapes, the radio, the correspondence course, and then the traveling ministry, which has seemed like lately I've been on the road about half the time, and uh, it just really keeping us busy, which is what I wanted. Praise the Lord. When I was in Florida a number of years ago, I had been out preaching. I preached evangelistically, and then I pastored. And I went to Florida to the call of the Lord, and that's where God separated me from the denominational system. And when I, when I mean He separated me from the denominational system, I don't mean He just separated me from a denomination. Uh, that took place too. But when He separated me from a denomination, I felt like that was the best denomination in the world, and um, there was no place else to go. I mean, no other denomination. I didn't want it. I said, that's the last one for me. I'm finished with man's organizations. And uh, so I, uh, when he separated me from that, I took a job, uh, first digging ditches, and then running a concrete mixer, and then selling insurance. I used to walk the streets with my insurance book, collecting debit and uh, trying to sell policies. And all the time I'm walking, I'm thinking, you know, uh, this is not my ministry. I'm not called to do this. I'm called to do something else. This is just a sort of a transitional thing here. And I'm, I'm really should be out preaching the gospel. So we did get on the radio there, and, and uh, we had uh, daily broadcast, a uh, disc jockey show, and a Sunday broadcast uh, preaching the gospel for years while we were there, but that wasn't really satisfying. I just really felt God wanted me out in full-time ministry, and eventually He did. 
he separated me again. But there was a peculiar thing. I would lay down at night in my bed, and uh, after a hard day, after trying to sell policies and trying to collect uh, insurance and so forth, I'd lay in bed, and before I could go to sleep, I'd just lay there, my eyes shut, and I could just see myself in a car driving across the country. Just driving everywhere, east, south, north, west, all over the country. I'd just see myself driving in the country. And another thing I saw, which I didn't understand, is I could see in my mind's eye, like sort of a vision, I could just see myself, and I wasn't asleep, it's just when I'd be resting and just uh, before I go to sleep, I could see myself driving up and down the streets of Springfield, Missouri. Now, I had no more reason to go back to Springfield, Missouri. I had uh, my home there in Panama City, Florida. Uh, we had built a home and uh, there, and we intended to stay there. We liked it, West Florida. I had no, no intention of going back to, to uh, Missouri. And yet I saw myself driving up and down the streets of Springfield. I said, yeah, let me think. I, I could see the streets. I could, I could see this section of town. I said, that's Camel Street. And we're just crossing college. And now it's down the hill to the railroad tracks. And I could just see myself going. And then I'd see another street. We're going out West Walnut. And, um, and I couldn't understand why these things keep coming to my mind like that. You know, I could see these things happening. And you know, all those things that I saw have happened. Praise the Lord. And um, we have been driving up and down the streets of Springfield, Missouri. All of those streets that I saw. And also all across the country. Praise the Lord. And um, in 49 of the 50 states. And the Lord has been gracious and... Uh, most of those states, not all 49, but most of them we have preached this sonship message in. And I appreciate the grace of God that's allowed us this privilege. Praise the Lord. And I want to talk about sonship tonight. And um, I'd like to read in Romans chapter 8. Anyone happen to have an Amplified Bible? Anybody got? All right. Could I read from your Amplified Bible, brother? Praise the Lord. This one here is Amplified. I can't read this small print, I think. Let me try this bigger one here. Thank you. All right. This is a little, be a little easier for me to read. I'd like to read this in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 14, and just uh, get a background of what this so-called sonship message uh, is about. Praise the Lord. Beginning in verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For the Spirit which you have now received is not a spirit of slavery to put you once more in bondage to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, the spirit producing sonship, in the bliss of which we cry, Abba, Father. That Holy Ghost that we have received is the spirit that produces sonship. It is not a spirit of bondage to bring us into religious bondage. And I hope I may... Uh, uh, preach. There's a message on my heart that I want to preach about, and there's four more nights after the night, and uh, I know other fine preachers are in. Maybe I'll get to preach once or twice more anyhow, and uh, I get into this message on the prisoners, the releasing of the prisoners, all right? But he says that the Holy Ghost that we have received, how many have received the Holy Ghost? Praise God. Now, I want to tell you what it's for. Amen. Somebody said, well, I know what it's for. It's to cast out devils and heal the sick. Well, I got news for you. They cast out devils and healed the sick before they ever got the Holy Ghost. Jesus sent out 70 of them. And he said, go out and cast out the devils, heal the sick, raise the dead, preach the gospel of the kingdom, and do it in my name. And they had no one of them ever spoke in tongues. Hadn't been baptized in the Holy Ghost yet. The Old Testament saints dried up the rivers, crossed dry shod through the Red Sea, quenched the violence of the fire, Stop the mouths of lions, capture armies single-handed. None of them ever spoke in tongues. But you say, didn't they have the Holy Ghost? Well, I'd like to read a verse for you in um, John chapter 7. John 7 and verse uh, 37. I don't want to forget where I'm at here. Come back to this. John chapter 7 and beginning about verse 35. <coughs> verse 37. Now on the great day of the feast, that last day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried and said in a loud voice, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And he that believeth on me, as the Scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, that they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. 
Hallelujah. Here in the Amplified it says, He was speaking here of the Spirit, whom those who believed in Him were afterward to receive, for the Holy Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now wait a minute. It very plainly says here, without any apology, that at this point in history, when Jesus stood on the day of the Feast of Tabernacles, during His life of ministry, that the Holy Ghost had not yet been given, but that He was talking about that Spirit that they that believe on Him should afterwards receive. Somebody said, well, wasn't John filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb? Wasn't his father, Zacharias, his mother Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Ghost? Didn't it say they were filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke out the words of the Lord, prophesied? Yes, it does. And the Holy Ghost came upon Elijah and Elisha, those men of God back there. But there was something that he was talking about here that was not the operation of the Holy Spirit that had been given to men to give them power to perform miracles. The Holy Ghost had been given to men to perform miracles. This is not what Jesus is talking about in John 7, 37 and 38. The Holy Ghost had been given to speak to men, reveal the secrets of hearts. God sent Samuel and the Holy Spirit Reveal the heart of Saul to Samuel. And he prophesied to him. The Holy Spirit was sent to Elijah the prophet. And I want to tell you, if you've got eight dollars, you buy that book on the mantle back there. Or I think it's cheaper in the paperback. It's well worth it. I've been reading it ever since I got here. I've never seen it before. But it's, an in, it's a beautiful book about the ministry of Elijah and the times in which he ministered. And how parallel those times are to the times we live in today, which is why God is again raising up an Elijah ministry in this last day. Hallelujah. But get that book. If they got enough of them, I'd like to see everybody get one on the mantle or Elijah. Elijah's a paperback, the mantle's a hardback. Okay. But God gave Elijah the Holy Spirit to call fire down out of the heaven. And they did these things by faith through the power of the Spirit of God. They didn't do that in their own power. It's the power of the Holy Ghost. And yet it plainly says here in John that at this point, long after the Holy Ghost had been given to Elijah, long after the Holy Ghost had filled John the Baptist in his mother's womb, long after Elizabeth had been filled with the Holy Ghost, it says the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. All right? What Holy Ghost is he talking about? It's the same Holy Ghost, but it's a different function of the Holy Ghost that is given to produce sonship in his body. Because the Holy Ghost that he's talking about here is that spirit that is given not to bring us into bondage, but to produce something in us. And that could not be produced until after Jesus was glorified. For this very simple reason, there is a principle that's laid down in the Scripture very clearly, and that is every Seed produces after its own kind. Watermelon brings forth watermelons. A corn of wheat brings forth wheat. A uh, dog brings forth puppies. Cats bring forth kitties. And if you've got an expectant dog in your house, you don't have to worry about maybe, possibly, probably having a house full of kittens. It isn't going to happen. Everything's going to bring forth after its own kind. And God ordained that the second Adam was going to fill the earth with his own kind. You see, uh, I don't know if I'm, I'm going to preach to what I thought I was going to preach, but anyhow, let me take off here. But in the first Adam, God said to him before he ever sinned, He said, Now, Adam, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and uh, fill the earth with your own kind. But Adam never did that while he was innocent, sinless. It was not until after he had fallen into sin that he began to multiply himself. And when Cain was born, Cain was not the second man on earth. No. Neither was Seth, nor Abel. They were only a part of the first man. In Corinthians, I'm a little more familiar right here, and I'll get back to this, but in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, and verse 45. So it is written, 
the first man, Adam. All right? All right, let me just say one thing here in passing about this particular statement. It says here that Adam is the first man. That means there wasn't any before him. That blows away all the uh, imagination theories about pre-Adamic races, etc., etc. Because Adam was the first man. It says plainly the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam. Now that just lets you know that whoever this is is talking about the last Adam. And I think we know who that is. That there's not going to be any more after him. Hallelujah. And yet, how many people have been born on this earth since Jesus was born? How many billions of people? There's about three or four billion living right now that was born on the earth after Jesus was, came to earth. And yet, he says, he was the last Adam. No more after him. All right? Let's go on a little further. The last Adam was made a quickening or life-giving spirit. The first man was a soul. The last man was spirit. The first man, verse 47, is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. So the second man was not Cain's son. You see, when God told Cain to multiply himself, then everyone that came forth in his likeness was not another man, but he was a part of the first man. The first man began to be a corporate man. The first man began to be a many-membered body. And the earth was filled with the image of Adam. That doesn't mean they're all the same height, the same weight, same color hair, same color eyes. But their character, their nature, they bore the image of that first man, Adam. As the fact of the matter is, that first man, Adam, as he began to multiply, he became a corporate body and the earth was filled with one man. And until the day the Bethlehem incident took place, the earth only had one man in it. One many-membered corporate man and his name, or as one place the Bible says their name, was Adam. Male and female made he them, and their name was Adam. And so this many-membered man was the first Adam. And then something happened. God sent a new seed into the earth. And where the first Adam did not have life in him. He was a man producing death. He was dying from the moment he was born on earth. He, went, he was in the process of mortality and the process of death from the moment he got on earth. And in, unless God had provided in our bodies the ability to reproduce cells in our bodies, those cells go through a complete change over seven years and we die off. But until age gets a hold of us and we lose the ability to reproduce ourselves, we just keep reproducing ourselves for every so often because that man is continually dying. Continu He's a man of death. But then a man came into the world and had no death in him. said in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God and the same was in the beginning with God and in him was life. And until he came there was no life in the earth. And God put life in the earth and his life was the light of men. Up until that time men's minds were darkened. Now I know that God worked with the Old Testament people and he shine his light upon some of them and he chosen some of them sovereignly as he did Abraham and Moses and others chose them sovereignly to speak to them and to use them but you read the story of their lives and you see a very primitive people even the best of the patriarchs of God's honored saints of God many of them lived very primitive lives because back there in those days the whole world was under darkness but when Jesus came he brought light and he said I am the light of the world and another man entered into the world. But he was just one man. And then God gave him the same commission he had given the first Adam. Because God had determined that that first Adam was going to be wiped out. The old heavens and the old earth were going to be destroyed with a fire and a, a great noise and, and a fervent heat and a new heavens and a new earth. We're going to come where in dwells righteousness. He wasn't talking about uh, more sand and 
loam and mountains and trees. There's no righteousness out there on the sand on the beach or in the water out there in the lake. You pull a fish out of the water, he's not righteous or sinful. Amen. And if you step on a snake and he bites you, he didn't sin. There's no sin. As far as the creation is concerned, it just does what it's nature to do. The only sin or righteousness is in the human vessels wherein is the life of God. But there's going to be new heavens and new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And that's talking about this earth and this heavens. Hallelujah. And God's going to do away with that old Adam. As Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so God determined that that man for flesh and blood shall not enter into the kingdom of God. That Adamic life will not go behind that veil. And so God determined that he was going to, out of that Adamic uh, man, he was going to redeem a people for his name. And so he took that seed of life that came into the world, one man. And when Jesus entered the world, now the world had doubled his population. Think of it. The world's population doubled in one Christmas night. <laughs> Hallelujah. Forgive me. But there was one man in the world, and all of a sudden now there's two men. Another total race of men. And as he grew into maturity, they found out that he didn't fit into their race. He was not the same kind of man that they were. And that's what I want to talk about tonight, is what manner of man is this? But I want to get on the story. Because as Jesus began to grow, and he began to mature, the Bible says in Revelation 3.14 that Jesus Christ is the beginning of the creation of God. Now, that doesn't mean that back there God created Jesus Christ just before he started the world into existence and so forth. The Word was with God in the beginning. He was back there before the world ever was. But there was a beginning of the creation of God, and that's when that second man came into the world. And God determined to do away with that Adamic creation and bring in his own life and begin to bring his own son into being in this world. So, he started his life here. And people didn't understand him. Hallelujah. But God determined. And he said, God determined that he should multiply himself and that he, the second Adam, as the first Adam did, should multiply himself and fill the earth with his own likeness and his own kind and become a corporate, many-membered man. So, he told his disciples, he said, uh, except a corn of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abides, but it abides alone. Now, it's peculiar when he said this. One time they came to Jesus and they said, uh, Philip came to him and he said, Master, show us the Father. And that'll be sufficient. Just show us the Father. And he looked at Philip and said, Have you been so long with me, Philip, and you haven't known the Father? You don't know who I am? He said, When you see me, you see the Father. What do you mean there? He was the express image of the Father, the brightness of His glory, the express image of His person, the image of the invisible God, and uh, when you saw him, you saw the Father. It was, as it were, that he had laid his own life down there at Jordan. And when he came up out of that river, that was a symbol of death. He laid down that man of Galilee, Jesus. And when he came up out of that water, the Spirit came upon him. And from then on, he never spoke his own words. He never went his own way. He never yielded to his own will. He had a will, but he turned his will, he turned his mind, he turned his body over to the Father as a vehicle through which the Father could reveal himself to the world, his creation. So here this man, this earthly individual, yielded himself that deity might express itself to humanity. And uh, now, three and a half years later, the Father's saying, you've done a beautiful job of being a vehicle of expression through which I can express myself to the world. Now I'm going to give you a body. David touched on this last night. I'm going to give you a body through which you can express yourself. But when Philip came as a show of the Father, he said, you've been looking at him. When you see me, you see what the Father's like. But something else happened. In the 14th chapter of John, some Greeks came to Philip one day, and they said to him, uh, Sir, we want to see Jesus. So Philip went and got some help this time. He got Andrew. And Philip and Andrew went to Jesus and he said, Master, 
There's some Greeks downstairs and they want to see Jesus. Now, it's not they want to see the Father. They want to see Jesus. So what did he say? Well, let me get my comb. I'll fix my hair here. I'll put on my best robe and I'll come down a little and see what he, Jesus looks like. No, that's not what he said. When they said, some Greeks down here want to see Jesus, he, he answered them, the Bible says. And his answer was, the time has come when the Son of Man should be glorified. Except the corn of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth a great harvest. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Master, don't want to be discourteous, irreverent to you, or anything like that. But our question was, these people want to see Jesus. We didn't come up here for a, um, for a uh, lesson in agriculture. We asked you a question about whether you go down and let these people see Jesus. What's this got to do with planting and harvesting? Everything in the world. It goes right on to say that what he's talking about is he's talking about his coming death. Because, you see, he was that corn of wheat. And he was expressing the image of the Father. But he said, when this corn of wheat is planted, it's going to bring forth the harvest, and that's when you're going to see Jesus. The world wants to see Jesus? All right, that's when they're going to see him, when this harvest comes into its fullness. Because when you see him, you see the Father. Hallelujah. Now, so God gave him the commission to come, become a many-membered man and to fill the world with his own kind. And when he was here, people didn't understand him. He... He didn't have fellowship with. Uh, he couldn't have fellowship with people. Uh, the uh, Jewish religious uh, community, they didn't know what to think about him. It's kind of phony. It's kind of fraud. Full of Beelzebub. Uh, you know, an imposter. They didn't know what about him. The drunks made up songs about him. Yeah, Psalms said how they would, and uh, his own disciples didn't understand him. Only by divine revelation. When he said to Peter, Who do men say that I am? Well, they think you're John the Baptist reincarnated. They think you're Jeremiah come back. They think you're this one, that one, the other one. And they were only telling the good things. They didn't tell us what some people said about him. He was only presenting the nice things they said about him. He said, Well, who do you think I am? And Peter got a divine inspiration from the Father. And he said, You're the Christ. You're the Son of God. Ah, he said, Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. But my Father revealed this. My Father in heaven. But you see, when he wanted fellowship, he could not unveil himself. He, there was a lot of things he'd like to tell them about. He had to tell the truths of the kingdom. He had to tell them in parables. So that those that had ears to hear could be taught by the Spirit. Most of the people in his day did not understand what he was talking about at all. And most of his disciples didn't hear what he was saying. He told them about his coming crucifixion, how this had to happen and so forth, and they didn't believe that. Peter took his sword out in the Garden of Gethsemane to protect him. And whenever the stone was rolled away, none of them were there. The women went down there with a bunch of spices to perfume his body, thinking it was dead. But the true body of Christ wasn't dead. A lot of people today come to church trying to spice up and perfume up this dead body of Christ. Well, I want to tell you something. The true body of Christ don't need all that perfuming up. It's not dead. Hallelujah. But he had to go out in the mornings, early, before anybody's awake. He went out and communed with the Father. That's the only one who understood him. Because, you see, everybody else was of a different race. But he was determined to fill this earth with people just like himself who could understand him, who knew something about him, who understood his nature and his truths. And that's, his, that's what he's in the process of doing. Hallelujah. Now, the reason the Holy Ghost was not yet given was simply because that He's going to bring forth sons in his own likeness. And he couldn't do that while he was still upon the earth because that was not the kind of son he was going to produce. He was going to produce a son, not just a perfect man, a beautiful ministry that could raise the dead and heal the sick and take dominion over the things around him, but he was going to produce a man of, out of a glorified state with a glorious body that could rule and reign forever. And that couldn't be done until after he was... Resurrected, because it was out of his resurrection life that this was going to be done. There's an illustration in the Old Testament about this. Where Abraham took his son Isaac up to the Mount Moriah at the call of God to offer him up as a sacrifice. Now Abraham was a little troubled about this because uh, this was a practice among the Baal religions and and the uh, 
false religions of the day, the heathens, they, they offered up human sacrifice. But God had always denounced human sacrifice, and Abraham could not understand why God was calling upon him for a human sacrifice. And besides all that, God had told him that in this boy here shall thy seed be known, and he, your seed shall bless uh, the, the nations. People all over the world is going to be blessed because of this boy and the seed that's coming to him. And he wasn't even married yet. Just a young lad. And yet God said, now offer him up. Well, now wait a minute. There's a conflict here somewhere. God says, kill him. And God has already said, he's going to get married, have children, and they're going to bless the world. Now how can those two words be harmonized? And the, the book of Hebrews chapter 11 tells us how that Abraham had it figured out. He said that the only way Abraham could figure that this was going to happen... Now, this word could be harmonized is that God would raise him from the dead. So he went up that mountain in faith, believing that he and that boy were going to come down from the mountain. And so told the servants at the foot of the mountain. He said, I and the lad will go up there and worship and will return again to you. He had faith in his heart that that boy would walk down the mountain even though he had offered him up as a sacrifice. He believed that God was going to resurrect him right up there before they came back down. Hallelujah. And so... The Bible says in Hebrews 11, and so he received him in a figure from the dead. In other words, in a figure, figuratively speaking, Isaac went through a resurrection. But it was not until after that resurrection that he had seed and had his son Jacob, who was the father of the twelve sons that started the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, he had to go through this resurrection first before he became a father according to the promise of God. Isaac was the promised son, but God had a plan. He wanted to show that that promised son had to be resurrected before he produced his own son who was to bless the nations and become a many-membered people. So we see Jesus. And Jesus was going to become a father. The Bible calls him a prince of peace, the everlasting father and the mighty God. Isaiah 9 and 6. That's what the Bible says he's going to be. An everlasting father. But he has to have a son. He has to have children to be a father. I've known men that were 60 and 70 years old, older than me, been a man longer than I have, but they weren't a father. Never had any children. So he was going to have, he was going to be a father, going to have children. But it did not please God to raise up another virgin girl, plant another perfect seed in her, bring forth a feminine person this time, and have a beautiful virgin-born girl that could be qualified to marry Jesus and raise children upon us earth. That is not his way. He's going to raise up a church. And that's going to be his bride. Hallelujah. And out of that church is going to come forth his sons. Now, but that Holy Spirit that came from Jesus, that life that came out of Jesus into his church, could not come into that church until after he had been glorified because it was out of that state of being that he wanted a life to come after he had overcome and prevailed and was exalted and raised up on high because that, my friends, is what he's going to do for us. Philippians 3, 20 and 21 says, For our citizenship is in heaven. It's not on this earth. That's why you feel so out of it in the politics and the things that's going on in this world because this is not your world. You're not a citizen of this dark age. You're a citizen of another age, another world. You're a citizen of where our citizenship is in heaven from whence we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change these vile bodies or the body of our humiliation. Weiss translation says it this way. said, this body by which we have been humiliated through the presence of sin and sickness and death and decay. We've been humiliated. When a saint of God falls into sin, it's a humiliation. When a saint of God gets sick, it's a humiliation. We're not supposed to. It's not our... We don't live in that kind of a land. It's simply that we're partaking of the world around us. When a saint of God dies, why, it's, uh, we've been humiliated. Because, see, we're not supposed to die. We have the life, eternal life of God in us. And uh, whenever I get sick, and there are times when I do, two or three times, in fact, in the last 40 years, the last 30 years. Uh, but... When this happens, I feel humiliated. Because, you see, I'm a citizen of, of a place that doesn't have that. That is no more than law books. Hallelujah. But he's going to change the, these bodies of humiliation and make them like unto his body of glory. His glorious body. Because that's the kind of man that's going to rule and reign with him. 
And this body has got to be uh, harmonized with the head. A lot of people say, oh, you people asking for too much. Too much. You, uh, you ought to be more humble. Just hope for a little cabin in the corner of glory land. <laughs> There's a preacher in San Diego here a while back, and they got beautiful homes in San Diego. And he's a pastor out there, and he was up to our place recently. He said, why should I hope for a cabin in glory land? I got better than that here. He got a nice big house out there in San Diego. That's what makes it not make. Uh, that's not what makes him uh, hope for heaven is to get him a cabin in glory, in the corner. But you see, people say, "Well, why don't you try to be more humble?" Well, you're reaching for too much. Well, let me say something to you. The Bible says that we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Well, that means not only that we inherit what He inherits, but that only that also means that He inherits what we inherit. So, what would you like for Jesus to have? You want him to have glory? You want him to have all things as his inheritance? Well, you're tied to that. So if you wish all things for him, you're really wishing all things for yourself too. I'll tell you something else. When I came into him, guess what else I inherited? I inherited you. Because you are his inheritance. And you inherited me. Take care of your inheritance. If somebody left you a fortune, you'd take care of it, wouldn't you? If you inherited something beautiful, some fortune, you'd look after it, wouldn't you? Even if, if it was kind of broken up a little bit, you'd take it and kind of fix it up a little better because it's yours now. Well, if you think I'm all busted up, fix me up a little bit. Because you, I belong to you. You belong to me by inheritance. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Second Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ how that though he was rich. I want you to notice how that's spelled. R-I-C-H. Rich. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. Now what did Jesus have when he was rich that he didn't have when he was poor? Cattle on a thousand hills. He was rich before there's any hills, before there's any cattle to put on them. Right. What made him rich? The thing that made him rich was the fullness of the nature of the Father. Hallelujah. I've got to read this to you. Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. <coughs> he said, let in verse 5, let this same attitude and purpose and humble mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Let him be your example in humility, who although being essentially one with God and in the form of God, possessing the fullness of the attributes which make God, God, did not think this equality with God was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained, but stripped himself of all privileges and rightful dignity, so as to assume the guise of a servant, a slave, in that he became like men and was born a human being. He that was rich made himself, nobody made Jesus poor, he made himself poor. Nobody stripped him forcefully of his rightful dignity, his oneness with God, that is, his uh, being in the form of God, possessing all the fullness of the attributes that make God God. Nobody forcefully took that away. He stripped himself of that and became a human being. He that was rich made himself poor. But, oh, this is the heavy part. The reason for that, it says, was so that we through his poverty, might become rich. Now, that's what the Scripture says. I mean, let me quote that Scripture for you again. I quote it from the King James. That's the one I know the best. But you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye, through his poverty, might become rich. Now, how do you spell that second rich? R-I-C-H. Same way you spell the first one. Likeness of God... What he was in the eternity's past, he stripped himself of that and came down to this earth for the purpose of making us like he was before he came down and made himself poor. Hallelujah. Now, John 17 and uh, verse about 5. Hallelujah. Looks like every page in this Bible has been marked up. That's wonderful. And now, Father, he said, I've finished the work. Verse 4, I finished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, 
glorify me along with yourself and restore me to such majesty and honor in your presence as I had with you before the world existed. Glorify me. King James says this way. Glorify me now, Father, with thine own self, with the glory I had with thee before the world was. All right, let's examine exactly what he's saying to the Father. He's saying, Father, okay, back here in eternity, over here, before I came down to earth, I call this when I'm his sojourn on earth, 30, 33 years, all right? But before he came to earth, he said, I had a glory with you. I was glorified with thine own self, with a glory back here before the world began. Now he says, I don't have that glory now. Here I am on earth. I don't have that glory I had with you before. But the Bible says he had a glory here. That we beheld his glory. Yeah. But you know what they beheld? They beheld, beheld the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. They beheld his glory as a son of God. But he had a glory with the Father that he had stripped himself of to come down here and take upon himself the form of a human. Now he says, I don't have that glory I had in the world before the world was. But he said, I finished the work here you gave me to do. You sent me down here to do. Now he said, I want back the glory I had with you. So the Father brought him out of the tomb rolled the stone away and exalted him above the highest heaven. He gave him back that glory, didn't he? Now he's back in eternity again and he has the glory he had with the Father before the world began. Do you believe he has it now? But he has something else he didn't have back there. See, here when he was on earth, he didn't have that glory that he had in eternity back, but he did have something he didn't have back there and that was he had a body. All right? But then... When they put him in the tomb, the Bible says that God would not suffer that body or that Holy One to see corruption. So he brought him out of the tomb. And contrary to those heretics that say that God just disintegrated and did away with that body because it had no more use now to him, that body is in the presence of God today. That physical body of Jesus Christ is in the presence of God for us. Because we are, he, we're looking for him to return from that invisible realm because we are going to have bodies just like his body of glory. Hallelujah. And that's not been disintegrated because we're not going to be disintegrated. We're going to have glorified bodies like his body of glory. But now, he, he, here on the earth, he had a body, but he didn't have the glory. Not that glory that he had with the Father before the world was. But he got that glory back, but he took the body along with him. Now he has that body appearing in, pre in the presence of God with that glory and his body appearing there for us. What does it mean? We have an anchor behind the veil whither Jesus, a forerunner, has already entered for us. So that a forerunner means somebody else has got to come after. And he's entered in there for us. That means that his body that is going to obtain that glory and going to uh, manifest that glory in the ages to come is not just the singular man, Jesus, but the corporate man, Jesus, the many-membered man that he's multiplied himself into now. Just as the Adamic man and all the rottenness, it took a long time for all of Adam, all the things that was in that soul man to finally appear upon the earth. In the days of Noah, it got wild. All kinds of sin, corruption, and rottenness were upon this earth as the Adamic man began to multiply and it began to more and more manifest what's really down inside of him. And I want to tell you in the ages to come, that new creation man is going to continue to glorify and begin to uh, break out and, and manifest more and more, not any corruption, but the glory that's within him. And just as that man continued to go further down and down into darkness and um, uh, degradation and decay and chaos, so the new creation man starts and he begins to unveil himself more and more in the ages to come. And of the increase of his government, there's no end. Hallelujah. So, what's he up there for? He's waiting for that many-membered body to come. And he said, He who was rich came down and made himself poor, stripped himself, that he, through his poverty, we might be what he was before he came down here. Now, that's just the teaching of the Bible. That's just what the Bible says. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a little scared to get into that and, and give what I think it means altogether. So I just leave it what it says. See, I'm not going to tell you what I think it means. I'll just tell you what I know it says. It says that that which he had before the world began is what he intends to give us in the ages to come. And that's why he made himself poor. is to make us what he was, R-I-C-H, what he was before he came down here. 
Hallelujah. Now, I want to go back to Romans 8. So he says, You have received the spirit of adoption, the spirit producing sonship, in the bliss of which we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself thus testifies together with our own spirit, assuring us that we are children of God. And if we are his children, then we are his heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, sharing his inheritance with him. Only we must share his sufferings if we are to share his glory. But what of that? For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, this present life, are not worth being compared with the glory that is about to be revealed to us and in us and for us and conferred on us. Hallelujah. Now I know and I can see that this, I'm not the first one that uh, has seen these things because all these letters are circled in red here. And this is not my Bible. All right. For even the whole creation waits expectantly and longs earnestly for God's Son to be made known, waits for the revealing, the disclosing of their sonship. For the creation was subjected to frailty, to futility, condemned to frustration, not because of some intentional fall on his part, but by the will of him who so subjected it, yet with a hope that nature, creation itself, will be set free from its bondage to decay and corruption and gain an entrance into the glorious freedom of God's children. We know the whole creation of irrational creatures has been moaning together in the pains of labor until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves too, who have and enjoy the first fruits of the Holy Spirit, we who have been baptized in the Holy Ghost, says we, uh, uh, which is a foretaste of the blissful things to come, we groan inwardly as we wait for the redemption of our bodies from sensuality and the grave, which will reveal our adoption, our manifestation as God's sons. What is it that's going to reveal our manifestation as God's sons? It's going to be this redemption of our bodies from sensuality and the grave. Now, those that are gone on by the way of the grave, the thing that will reveal them as sons of God is when they come forth. The thing that will reveal us as sons of God is when God redeems us, these bodies, to the place that we are no longer dependent upon our five senses. David was preaching yesterday about not relying upon the sight of the eye or hearing of the ear. You know why? We have our five senses and we, uh, the logic of our mind. Most of us are, um, we're controlled by what our soul does. What we, what are, you know, our will, emotions, intellect. These are parts of the soul. And it's the soul man that determines most of our decisions. But Jesus never made a decision according to his will or his emotion or his intellect. He did only know what the Father told him to do. He was continually guided by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. New creation man. Now the apostles... About everywhere they went, <coughs> they one thing that they had in common, everywhere when they went to preach, they started out pointing people to Jesus. In uh, Acts chapter 8, we find Philip going down to Samaria and preaching, and said he went down to the city of Samaria and he preached Christ. Very simple statement, just preach Christ. And then he said after he got through that revival and he went out into the desert, he found this eunuch along in his chariot. He ran and joined himself to the chariot. He said to the man, you know what you're reading? And the man said, no, I don't know what I'm reading. I'm from the book of Isaiah here, and I don't know what the prophet's talking about. And so he started the same scripture. He didn't say to him, well, I've got a better scripture for you. I've got one here that talks about somebody I want to talk about. He started the same scripture and started preaching Jesus to him. Everything, every place they went, first thing they wanted to do is talk about Jesus. Why? Because the whole subject of sonship, the whole um, content of revelation of the understanding of the Word of God and the purpose of God is involved or resides and contained in our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and uh, let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, in discussing this theme of sonship and what the new creation man is going to be, as I told you, this new creation man that we're talking about tonight is a many-membered man. It's called a man-child. It's called the overcomer, him that overcometh. It's always referred to in the singular, by the way. Um, the word overcomer is never mentioned in the plural. Always in a he that overcometh. One time it only, the closest ever came. 
to say anything in the plural about overcoming was said they overcame by the word of the Lamb, the word of the, their testimony. And when look to see where they were, who it was they were that overcame, they were the man child. And throughout the word it's he that overcometh. So whatever you want to call this, saints of the most high God, the overcomer, the man child, it's a many membered company of people that are coming forth in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ because they have a life of God and the Holy Spirit has been given to produce sonship in them and out of those that let the Holy Spirit have his work, amen, and release themselves to him and let him do it, he is going to produce sonship. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, um, so Jesus is the very central theme of all the topic of the sons of God uh, the church without spot and wrinkle, you have to start with him. He's the foundation stone. He's the chief cornerstone. And just what manner of man is this, anyhow? I want to read you a little incident that happened to the disciples over in the book of Mark, chapter 4. They never forgot this. Scared them to death. Really? Hallelujah. You know, I, I was running into so many people said, Oh, if I could have only been back there in Palestine and Canaan land in those days and could have walked the shores of Galilee with Jesus, actually been there to touch the hem of his garment and all that. I want to tell you, if you'd have been around close to that man, the chances are, 99% of the chance would be that he'd have scared the living daylights out of you. Right. He was the strangest man this world had ever seen. Really, he was. Now, I'm not going to speak disparagingly of my Lord Jesus Christ. See, I can do nothing but exalt Him and praise Him. But I want you to see Him tonight like they saw Him that were around there. See, His disciples are very sincere men. They left their jobs. They left their, their uh, uh, nets. They left their future in this world to follow this 30-year-old, what today I'd call, young boy. When I was 25, I wouldn't have called him a young boy. <laughs> I thought he was a grown man. And of course they are. See? One thing's a little hard for me to get through my head, see? My son's now 30 years old. And it's a little hard for me to get through my head that he's as old as Jesus was when they had five of them following him around. I, I mean, 12 of them following him around. And here my, uh, my boy is 30 years old and, and I, I, you know, I still feel like he's just my son, you know. Come on, son, sit down. I want to talk to you. Sometimes he has to come to me and say, Dad, sit down. I want to talk to you. <laughs> That's when it gets uh, kind of embarrassing. Praise God. Anybody right here 30 years old? Just, just barely 30. 29. 28. 32. 33. Anywhere right? All right. Hallelujah. But I want you to look at this young man. And those fellows that followed him, they were very sincere people, but they had a problem with him. They, they went through a lot of misunderstandings. And there was a lot of very sincere scribes and Pharisees in his day. A lot of them later followed Jesus. Thousands of the priests turned to the Lord after the Pentecost. And there's some very sincere people back there, men like Nicodemus. They wanted to know, what, what is this? See, they had to, they, he came to him by night because he didn't, he's afraid what to be said about him, didn't want to hurt his reputation and so forth, but, but he was hungry. Men like Nathaniel, without hypocrisy, without guile, Jesus said. Yet he had his reservation about this man, said, well, no, nothing, nothing, he can't be the uh, Christ. No good thing can come out of Nazareth. Nothing's ever been prophesied. I know the word well enough to know this man's not qualified to be the Christ. And there was some, I'm not talking about some of those hypocritical, um, devil-possessed priests and scribes back there that fought Jesus from the word go. I'm talking about men who really were sincere and who wanted to know if this man here, this young man, really has something from God or not. And uh, I want you to see how they had to look at him and the problems they had to overcome to accept him. Let's read here in chapter 4. And the same day, when the evening was come, he saith unto his disciples, Let us pass over to the other side. When they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as it was in the ship. And there was also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you are, have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the way sea obey him? Now, that doesn't sound so exciting, just reading it here in a dull monotone, in the nice weather we're having. 
Weren't you happy to see the sunshine today? Amen. I believe the Lord's going to give us a good day tomorrow. Hallelujah. And, uh, but I want to go back in that little scene again and try to let you know that this was actually happening to people, real people like me and you. All right? And they set out across the Sea of Galilee. And they got into this storm. And it was a rough one. Now, these were not tourists from Corinth or Egypt or someplace that had never been on the sea before. You know, they panicked. These were fishermen. These were men who lived on the sea. These were men who had been in storms before. These were men that knew how to take their care of themselves out there on the sea. But they had never been in a storm like this one because this one got them to the place where they knew they were done for. They gave up. They fought that storm. They did everything. The wind, the waves roared, and they filled the boat up. The big waves were slept in there, and they were bailing out water and throwing out water. So everybody wearing themselves plumb out, rowing for all they had, might they had. And here they were, and they were exhausted. And finally, their strength they gave out. They couldn't fight this thing anymore. And guess what? They found out there was a fellow laying up here in the back part of the boat that hadn't turned his hand to help them. How would you like to be wore out to a frazzle fighting for your life and find out that you needed every hand you can get, everybody bail, everybody roll, hurry, help everybody get into this thing. And here's somebody sleeping, sleeping through this storm, not helping them bail one bucket of water out of the ship. And uh, when they came to him and woke him up, they were very common fishermen. The Bible doesn't give us any explicit uh, details of how they woke him up. But I am convinced, knowing the impetuosity of Peter and, and some of the other disciples and uh, Simon the Zealot and, and uh, James and John the Sons of Thunder and some of the things they could do, I'm convinced that when they woke him up, they didn't say, uh, Master, Master, uh, wake up please, wake up please, we got an emergency here, you know, we're sinking, we're going to die. No, I don't think that's the way they went to him. When they discovered that he was asleep in the back of the ship and they were going down and they lost all hope, <laughs> I think they were exasperated. What kind of a man is this that would let us do all the work and him sleep and now we're all going to sink together? And we've been following him all this way. Give up everything to follow this guy. Here he is. He really looked like a lazy man, didn't he? Terrible. Didn't care. And they woke him up. Wake up! Wake up! Don't you care? We're going to die! And he got up, looked around. First thing he did was take care of the situation. He said, Peace, be still. And the Bible says, Immediately, the wind and the waves died down. The sea was like glass. Then he turned around then and he said, What's the matter with you fellas? Where's your faith? Don't you know that anything I do, you're supposed to do? What was he doing? He was demonstrating what a son of God was supposed to be like. And the Bible says, and they feared exceedingly. Now, they were scared before of the storm. But what are they afraid of now? There's no storm. They're now sinking. <laughs> You'd think they'd be jumping up and down, shouting, praising God, and talking in tongues. No, they're scared now than they were before. They're more, they're more frightened of this man than they were of the storm. It said they feared exceedingly now, and they said, what kind of a man is this? They didn't know what kind of man he was. Hallelujah. Well, I'll tell you what kind of a man he is. He's the kind of a man that he wants on this earth multiplied 144,000 times just to grab a figure out of the air. All right? <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. But, you see, um, John wrote later in a couple of places, he said, you know, all the things that Jesus done wasn't recorded in this book. He said if everything that Jesus did was recorded, the world itself couldn't contain all the books that ought to be written. But he said the things that are written are written that you might know that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you might have life. Now let me say that again. Let me paraphrase it this way. John was saying everything that Jesus did wasn't written down, wasn't recorded, but what was written was written so that you might know what a son of God is like and that by believing on him you might have that same life in yourself. 
What he did in demonstrating on this was to demonstrate to his people what a son of God was supposed to be like so that if you can believe in him, you can have that same sonship life in your Hallelujah. What manner of man is this? That's her question. And that's the question that was facing the people back there. You see, everybody knew, as we know today, that the way to come to God and the way any man has to come to God is by repentance and sorrow for your sin and turning away from sin and come to God sorrowful and repenting and say, God, I'm sorry. I've been a mess, but by your grace, I want you to take me in. And repentance is the only way anybody can come to God. And you try to come to God and say, well, God, I know I've been a sinner. I've been a gambler and a cheat and a thief and I killed a couple of guys and, and so forth and all the adultery I've committed and all this stuff, but I've decided that's, that life is for the birds and and so I'm going to quit that, and I'm going to come to you, and I know you're happy to get a man as brilliant as I am and, and as uh, smart as I am. I could run business, boy, I could run churches and things, you know. And so I know you're glad to get me in your, on your side, see. That is no way to come to God. You can't find God that way. The only way to come to God is repentance, sorrow in your heart for the rebellion that you've carried around in time past. But you want to know something? Now, all the Pharisees knew that, theologically, they have that damn path. But you know something? Nowhere, nowhere can we find it recorded that Jesus ever manifested any repentance. Never came and repented. Never came to the Father saying, Father, I'm sorry. I made a mess. I'm, I, I'm a, I made a mistake. And I'm just so sorry about that. If you'll forgive me, I'll try to be better tomorrow. Nowhere. And they looked at him and he challenged them and said, Find a mistake in me. Convince me of sin. He claimed in front of the public to be perfect. And they couldn't handle that. Here's a 30-year-old man coming and telling us, as long as we've been in the ministry, 40 years I've been a priest in the temple, and this guy comes along and tries to tell me he's never made a mistake, never sinned, has nothing to repent of. They had a hard time with that. What manner of man is this? He went through the pool of Bethesda that had a multitude of sick people in it, cripples, impotent, blind. He walked through that whole thing he stopped. He said to one man, Would you like to be healed? And the guy began to give him a theological argument. Why he couldn't be healed? You know, well, the, the, the record says it's so-and-so. You've got to get down there to the pool. Nobody's here to help me. Now, if you'll stay here and help me, uh, you know, maybe you can get me down there in time and all. He said, That's all that theological stuff is unnecessary. So just take up your bed and walk. Walked off and left him. And the guy just got up and started walking. And, and worse than all, it was on the Sabbath day. But he started walking off carrying his bed. Now, Jesus walked through the rest of that place and as far as we know, he didn't heal one more person and didn't apologize. I'd feel awful bad if I went into a place and saw all these crippled folks around and I had the power to heal them. I'd just pick one of them out and heal him, walk on off and let the rest of them feel sick. I'd feel terrible. But he didn't feel terrible. And he didn't confess that he made a mistake or, or, or didn't apologize for not doing a better job. Hallelujah. He said one time, John chapter 6, he said, uh, I think it's verse 7, he said, I picked you 12 to be my apostles, one of you is the devil. And you know, he never did indicate that he was sorry he made a mistake. I'm just as sorry. I should have used better judgment. I should have prayed another 24 hours there. That night I prayed for, you know, the Father to lead me by the Spirit to get these. I should have, you know, uh, well, 11 out of 12 ain't bad, but oh, if I could only got that. He never did apologize for that, picking the wrong guy for that job. Hallelujah. And, uh, one time his disciples, you know he had some that loved him. They, were re they really loved him. And one of them got real sick. And his sisters sent word to him, Master, please come quick. Your beloved friend, the one who's opened his home to you and has taken care of him, fed you many times, you know, when you're in this area, he's really sick. He needs you now. He's blessed you when you were here and, and he's, you know, you had real good friendship together, but now he needs you. Hurry, hurry, hurry. And he wouldn't come. And uh, he didn't even send word and say, well, i got an important meeting going up here. Or revival's really breaking out, you know, and I can't come now. I'll just have to put it off. He didn't even tell him why he didn't come. Didn't say a thing. Just tarried until finally the guy died. Four days later, Jesus showed up. And I don't see him coming in saying, oh, girls, I'm awfully sorry. I made a mistake. I thought he'd still be here, you know, and I could heal him. I, I'm so sorry, and please forgive me. I don't ask him, uh, I don't see him asking him to forgive him for being late. And the brother been dead in the grave four days. And his body decaying by now. And Jesus never apologized for that. 
And the girls both accused him. First thing they said to him, both of them, when they saw him, said, If you'd have been here. He said, Hang on. You're going to see the glory of God. <laughs> well, what about, the, what about the Pharisees? You know, I want you to see what, kind, what they, problem they had with this man. Because we've got to see what kind of a man this is, you see. Because he is the pattern for a body. And the Pharisees, they were in the world of pagan and heathen religions, in the world of Roman brutalities, of Grecian sexual indulgences and immorality, of the uh, Egyptian um, idolatries and all that. Israel was the one nation on God that knew and worshipped the one true and the living God. Now, true, they weren't doing a too good of a job of it at that time, but there's a lot of people around, and uh, a lot of those Pharisees, they really were zealous, men like the Mayor, they, they told it like they saw it. And here come this young man along, and what did he do? He stood up and he looked at them and he said, You bunch of hypocrites. You generation of vipers, you. You are of your father the devil. And if I would get up in front of the ministerial association of my city and start talking like that, you know the word to get out on me? No one. Them or their churches would ever speak to me. Hallelujah. They'd pass the word quick. And here's this young man. Many of those guys, gray-haired, gray beards, and he gets up and tells them, you're a generation of vipers. And not only that, but he goes into their church without consulting the pastor, without even giving him by your leave from the high priest, and goes in and starts turning the money tables over, starts turning the doves loose, and the place becomes a chaos. He didn't even say, uh, with your permission, I'd like to clean this mess up here. Uh, high priest, would it be all right if I minister here this tonight? Uh, be all right if I take the pulpit for a while? He didn't ask them nothing. You know what happened to me? If I go into First Baptist Church <laughs> or St. Peter's Cathedral on Christmas evening and I got all those can- television cameras on, you know, with their midnight mass, if I'd happen to walk down the aisle there and get past the guards and start grabbing the crucifix out of the Pope's hand, waving it out in front of those, those cameras, you know, and saying, Thus saith the Lord, this uh, mess is going to go, be uh, destroyed. I want to tell you, brother, I'd never make it out of there, no. Not if I did it in my own strength. I sure wouldn't. They'd mob me. They'd tear me limb from limb. And the television cameras would probably record every bit of it. Because <laughs> it'll be on live television tonight, you know, that big, that big mess. Miss Mass <laughs> from Rome will be on the TVs tonight if it uh, goes according to uh, what it usually is on this night. A midnight Mass uh, Mass will be on it. And, and can you imagine what happened if somebody run down there and grabbed the, the thing and started turning that thing upside down? That's exactly what he did in the temple. And they couldn't stand against him. Hallelujah. Because the Holy Ghost was so upon him. And they said, what kind of a man is this anyhow? Okay. Well, the reason that he couldn't confess to making a mistake, the reason that he never apologized for not doing better is that everything he did was by the leadership of the Spirit. Every word that he spoke was from the Father, and he was not about to apologize for the Father. And furthermore, that's the kind of a man that he is raising up in many members in this last day. There will be a people on this earth who will speak only the words of the Father, who will walk only in the steps that the Holy Ghost directs them to, and will only do the works, or fail to do the works, that the Holy Ghost leads them or doesn't lead them into. Hallelujah. And they will not apologize for their mistakes. They will not be begging God to help them do better. They will just do those things as a son that the Father directs him. And that's what he was demonstrating. You know, this man also, he had some, he demonstrated dominion over the forces of nature, over the laws of God, the laws of nature that, that God had put in. For instance, there is a law of gravity. And the law of gravity says, and it's a very good law. God put it here for our protection. Keep us from flying off this world and spinning around so fast. If it wasn't for the law of gravity, we'd go spinning out in space. Right. But the law of gravity, because the world's spinning and so forth, and I don't really feel it, but that's what they tell me. But the law of gravity says, 
that uh, you'll stay here on the earth and, it, and it, you know, and God has given us the ability to stand up straight. But if you're on the top of a ten-story building, say, well, I just don't believe I want to obey the law. I'm going to be rebellious against the law of gravity. I'm not going to obey it. You step off there, I tell you, it'll, that law will break your neck. It'll destroy you. That's right. But here's a man that was not subject to the law of gravity. He come walking across the water towards the, the, the boat, and they looked at him, and they cried out, it must be a ghost. They could not imagine a man walking on the water because, you know, the law of gravity said you can't do that. But he demonstrated the Son of God is not subject to the laws of nature. Hallelujah. Galatians 4 says that before we come to our majority, before we come into full sonship, into the adoption, the wheel thesis, the place of the full-grown son, that we are subject to the laws of nature around us, to the elements of the world. But when he came, he demonstrated that a full-grown, matured son, and he had his adoption, by the way, at the River Jordan, as I think uh, Brother Alsobrook, uh dealt with last night, and let me say it again in case you weren't here, that the word adoption in the Bible is not a legal term. It's not a term where you take somebody else's child and adopt them into your own family. It's taking a child in your own family and placing him as a full-grown son to take responsibility alongside with you of the responsibility of your business and home. And that is called the bar mitzvah in the Jewish uh, terms. And uh, anyhow, they, they have a time when they present the son and say, This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And uh, that usually happened when that son came to full age where the father could say, Now, here's the checkbook, here's the ring put the ring on his finger, and the ring was not just a, like a wedding ring like I'm wearing here, but it, it was a ring with a signet on it, a signet ring, so you could stamp that into the hot wax, and that was a signature. And uh, so when that father gave the prodigal son the ring, he was actually giving him his own signature, so now he could do business. He wasn't any longer as a servant. The prodigal came back and said, I'll be willing just to be a servant for this. Let me put my feet under your table. Let me work in your fields. He said, well, that's a good kind of a spirit. He said, when you had the spirit of a servant, even though I knew you was a son, but you had the spirit of a servant, you wanted your wages. You wanted to take your own wages and then go spend them. And he said, then I had to give you your wages and let you go waste them. But he said, now that you come back and you got the spirit of a servant, now you can be a son. Hallelujah. Jesus come, he was a son, but he had the spirit of a servant. He came to be the servant of God. He came to serve the people. He said, I didn't come to be ministered to, but I came to minister, to serve, and to give my life a ransom for many. And so... The signet ring is on there. And when this son is pushed in, this is what happened to Jesus at the River Jordan. When he came up out of that water, a voice spoke out of heaven and said, This is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. He was introducing this one now, who's going to start taking his place in the work of the Father. Up to that point, there'd been no miracles work. Irregardless of what the lost books of Eden say, there were no miracles before he came uh, up out of that River Jordan. That's when the Holy Spirit came upon him to anoint him uh, in his full-grown stature as the Son of God that he might take his place in the business of the Father. Up to that point, all he'd been doing is asking and answering questions and working in a carpenter's shop and growing and waiting for God's hour. But the time came and the adoption took place in his life. And Galatians tells us that until that adoption takes place, the elements of the world have us in subjection. Jesus was not under subjection to the elements of the world. Hallelujah. When... Uh, he came out there walking on the water, and they thought it was a spirit. He said, it's not a spirit, it's me. Peter said, if it's really you, you bid me to come walk on the water too. So he said, come. And Peter got out of that boat, and he started walking. He wasn't walking on the water. He was walking on the Word. He was walking on Jesus' Word, come. C-O-M-E. He walked on that Word all the way to, till he almost got Jesus, and then started looking at the water around him, and he started getting his mind off the Word, and he started to sink. But bless old Peter. Jesus took him and lifted him back up and they walked all the way back to the ship. That's something the other fellows didn't do. So don't fault him for <laughs> what he did do. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. You know, he was willing to make a mistake to get the experience. Bless God, you know, I know some people, they never make a mistake. Never do anything. That's all the people don't make mistakes is they'll never attempt anything. Hallelujah. But he was not subject to the law of gravity. He demonstrated that. He was not subject to the law of space and time. Another time he came walking across the water and the, and the disciples had gone out. And the Bible says this very plainly. And I, I don't want to read the scripture because I'm, I'm pressed for time. Uh, but it is. I'm, I'm going to wind this up now in just a minute, I think. But he started walking across one time and his disciples, had, he went up in the mountain to pray and the disciples got in a boat and started to go across the Sea of Galilee. 
and they got so many furlongs out, which meant they were just about one-third of the way or less across the sea. They had about six miles to go. And they got into a, uh, a, a, the seas began to be contrary to them, and they couldn't make any headway. And they were rowing and rowing, and they couldn't get a headway. And here he'd come walking across the water. And they, they scared him first, and then he, he came in the boat with them. And after he got in the boat with them, the Bible says a very strange thing. It says immediately. They were at the place whether they were going. Immediately. Brother, he picked that ship up. Time and space disappeared. He took dominion over time and space. And right there, about six miles was completed right across that sea in just a moment of time. Hallelujah. He demonstrated that the Son of God was not limited. Now, why did he demonstrate that? He was showing us what a Son of God is like. Now, what's that interest to us for? That's just history, isn't it? No, it's not history. It's prophecy. Hallelujah. All right. All right, let me just say this. Amen. He was a new creation. I mentioned that to you, didn't I? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that if any man be in Christ Jesus, what is he? Old things have passed away, but he is a new creature, a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 15, it tells us that he has torn down, broken down the middle wall of petition between Jews and Gentiles, that he might take both Jew and Gentiles and make one new man. That's what God is doing, making in himself, Christ is making in himself one new man. And this new creation man is what I want to present to you tonight and tell you what kind of a man it's going to be. What manner of man is this? This new creation. He's going to be a man that's going to be in the likeness of God. He's going to be a man, his nature and his temperament, his authority, everything is going to be in the likeness of his God. He's going to be a man of whom Jesus Christ himself is the head. Hallelujah. And Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13, it tells us there that that this uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, past teachers are given for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. That's that new creation man he's talking about. Unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is given to until we can come to the knowledge of the Son of God. So if everybody knows who the Son of God is, you'd be surprised. He's got a revelation of who the Son of God really is. And it's a knowledge, more than just knowing about Him, but it's a knowledge of that Son of God, to be a one with that Son. That's what the ministers are given to us for. This new creation man is not subject to Adam or his failures. He's not subject to sin. He's not subject to Satan. In fact, in John chapter 30, uh, 14 and verse 30, it tells us Jesus said, The ruler of this world has come, and he has nothing in me. The Amplified says, He's come, he checked him out, and he said he had, we had nothing in common, and he said, he has no power over me. Satan came, he checked Jesus out every way he could. All right? But Jesus was not subject to Satan because he was not of the soul man. It was a man of the soul that let Satan in. And that's where Satan's been working, in that soul realm. But Jesus came as a life-giving spirit. He's not subject to death. Amen. And um, as we read, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 26, he said that after he rules and reigns uh, until all things are put under his feet and the last enemy be destroyed is death. And that is an enemy. And that's going to be destroyed. And Jesus came to destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Praise the Lord. This new creation man is going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. I'm going to wait till tomorrow night to tell you about some more about how that new creation man, his relationship with uh, the Lord Jesus Christ the head. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com or lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.